G'day mates, it's Mr. Buddy here and today we're going to be taking a look at another what if Pokemon region. Now in case you're out of the know, I do a series of videos on my channel where I talk about hypothetical Pokemon regions that could be made out of real life countries and areas. I've already done videos on Greece and the western US and today I thought I would try to tackle one of the countries that has gotten a crazy amount of requests in the comments. Australia. Now before we get into all my ideas for the land down under, there's just a couple things I need to mention. The first is that, as always, this video is not meant to be speculation on a new Pokemon game's region. If a new Pokemon game is coming out when you're watching this, and the region or Pokemon have similarities to the ones I'll be talking about today, just know that I had no idea and this video was always meant to be just a fun, idea-filled video, rather than serious speculation. The second thing I want to mention is to keep your ideas and suggestions coming. In my past regional videos, you guys gave tons of awesome ideas for not just other countries you'd like to see me tackle in these what if videos, but some of your own ideas and thoughts for the regions that I've talked about too, which I think is great. It's always cool to hear other people's ideas, so feel free to keep sharing your own thoughts and suggestions in the comments. Alright, the third thing is please check out the description below for a list of all the artists who helped make this video. They're all great, and without their help I really wouldn't have been able to properly show my thoughts on what I think this region could be like. Final thing to briefly touch on is that this video is probably going to be pretty long, so if you want to jump around between sections, here's some timestamps. In my Western US video, I cut a lot of stuff from it because I thought most people wouldn't want to watch a 30 plus minute video. But much to my surprise, a lot of people in the comments were actually pretty supportive of the idea of longer what if region videos, so for today's region, I've cut out almost nothing. Obviously, there are a few things I had to trim down or take out, but for the most part, what you're about to watch is 99% of all my ideas on what this region could be like, and I'm really excited to share it all with you guys. Alright, I think that's enough for introductions. Koalas, the Outback, and so much more awaits us, so let's officially get this video started and take a look at what Australia might be like as a Pokemon region. One thing I want to address right off the bat before we get into the bulk of this video with the specific towns and new Pokemon and all that stuff is just what exactly Australia is like in terms of its geography and wildlife and how they could translate into the landscapes and Pokemon of this hypothetical region. A common misconception about Australia is the idea that it's only made up of arid deserts and has tons of dangerous animals all over the place that can kill you. Now don't get me wrong, it's definitely true that most of central Australia is covered by deserts and has some of the scariest animals in the world. But, at the same time, the country also has plenty of non-desert environments as well as more normal animals that help shape its ecosystem. Rainforests, mountains, grasslands, snowy areas, and coastal beaches help make up Australia's environments while various animals like koalas, wombats, emus, and echidnas populate them. The whole country isn't just a gigantic desert with killer spiders running around, and for this region, I really tried to strike a balance between the harsher, more well-known side of Australia and the less deadly, more diverse side to make for an all-around balanced region. I do have to admit though that the deadly side of this region with the more dangerous Pokemon could potentially play a larger part in the story, but we'll talk about that a little later. For now, since we're not quite to the story stuff yet, let's go over what existing Pokemon could be found in this region and their general locations. For the most part, I looked at real life animals that live in Australia and chose their Pokemon counterparts for these areas, but full disclaimer that there are some Pokemon I chose just because I thought they would fit in well. So in the arid environments and deserts, which would take up a fairly large part of this region, I think you'd be able to find Pokemon like Joltik, Galvantula, Spinarak, Ariados, Skorupi, Drapion, Sandile, Crocorock, Crocodile, Heliolisk, Helioptile, Cacnea, Cacturn, Mightyena, Ekans, Arbok, Saviper, Larvitar, Pupitar, Tyranitar, Gibble, Gabite, and Garchomp. In the rainforest areas, you would find Pokemon such as Hoot Hoot, Noctowl, Krogunk, Toxicroak, Spoink, Grumpig, Caterpie, Metapod, Butterfree, Heracross, Gumi, Slagoo, Morlil, Carnivine, and Paris. Seaside and beach areas could have Pokemon like Alamomola, Barboach, Seal, Mantine, Carvana, Sharpedo, Goldeen, Sea King, Whalmer, Krabby, Sfeel, Celio, and Corsola. While mountain forested places might have Pokemon such as Kamala, Vulpix, Amolga, Zangu, Skiddo, Gogoat, Stantler, Bunnelby, Zubat, Goldbat, Wubat, Chatot, Starly, and Staravia. There's no way I could detail every possible Pokemon this region might have, but that's just a brief overview of what the possible selection could be like. I think it's awesome how diverse Australia is in real life, and I really wanted that to transfer over to this region's environments as well as Pokemon selection. Okay, let's move on now to the specific towns and locations this region might have. Since we just talked about the types of environments as well as older Pokemon that would appear in the region, it's only natural we next discuss the big places and locations trainers would travel between on their journeys. 
As I've mentioned, most of the central area of Australia is covered in deserts, and because of that, there isn't really a lot of cities towards the center of the country. Most of the big cities and landmarks are instead located along the coasts, which made creating this region's layout somewhat challenging. My early concepts weren't great, as most of them ended up looking like a giant circle, but after brainstorming for a while, I think I was able to create a region layout that resembles Australia moderately well, while also having a much more interesting structure than just a giant loop of routes. Alright, let's start taking a look at the cities and begin with the player's starting town, which would be based on the city of Albany. This is the oldest settled town in Western Australia and is a somewhat larger city containing a port, numerous museums, and even a wind farm. It's become somewhat of a tradition in Pokemon games for the player to start off in a smaller town, and while real life Albany isn't necessarily the smallest town around, I think it could be adapted into a starting location with ease. Traveling northwest from the starting town, the player would arrive in a place based on the city of Perth. Perth is one of the largest cities in Australia and would provide plenty of sights to see and things to do. Some of the cool things in Perth include the Perth Zoo, which I think in region could be related to the Professor, the Aquarium of Western Australia, which could maybe be a Pokemon Reserve, the Fremantle Prison, which could possibly be a battle area, and Swan Valley, which is known for its wines in real life Australia, but in this region could be a location that local Swana hang out at. When leaving the Perth town, the player has a couple options of where to go next. They can either go north to a city based on Port Hedland, or east to a smaller location based on the Super Pit Gold Mine. Let's go up to the Port Hedland based town and we'll come back to the Gold Mine a little later. So Port Hedland is famous for being one of the main places where goods are shipped out of Australia, and many of the railways which span across the country bring various resources, such as ore and minerals, to the city which are then sent off around the world. There's just so much they can do with this town and region, and a lot of it could come from drawing upon the real life town's train yard and general industrial feeling. Continuing on past Port Hedland, you would come to a smaller town based on Halls Creek. Halls Creek is an interesting place because its general area has been inhabited for thousands of years by the aboriginal people of Australia. I know I keep saying this, but this would make a fantastic city for an Australian region to have. The town in region could have ancient ruins in it with the aboriginal Australian style, while also including some of Halls Creek's other landmarks in the surrounding area. Things like the China Wall Rock Formation and Wolf Creek Crater could be really cool points of interest to include in the general area and not to get too off topic, but they could totally incorporate Deoxys and other alien Pokemon on at a crater site like this. Okay, going south from the Halls Creek town will put you into this region's desert area. I've already mentioned it, but Australia has a lot of deserts within it, and I decided to kind of group all of them together to make one gigantic super desert for this region. It's mostly inspired by the Great Victorian Desert of Australia, but would have elements of the Gibson Desert, Little Sandy Desert, and Great Sandy Desert. I know people aren't usually the biggest fans of desert areas within Pokemon, but I felt like this region had to have one that was rather large to represent Australia faithfully. Also, another reason why I made the desert location so prominent is because I think it could be pretty significant to the overall story of this region. Without getting too deep into the details, because we're not quite to the story section yet, I think the hostility of this desert with its large size, abrasive terrain, and strong Pokemon could factor into the evil team's ambitions as well as possibly be connected to a legendary Pokemon. We'll talk about the evil team soon enough, but as far as how the desert is related to the legendary, we'll need to take a look at the next location of this region to get the complete picture. Enter Uluru. In case you haven't heard of it, Uluru is a giant sandstone formation that sits in the middle of Australia and has incredible cultural importance to its aboriginal people, and in general is seen as a source of pride for many Australians. It's even sometimes referred to as the heart of Australia, which I think communicates its significance a lot more than I can. With this place being such an important landmark to Australia, I knew that I wanted a location based on Uluru in this region to be pretty important as well, which is why this should be where one of the legendary Pokemon of the region resides. That's actually one of the reasons why I think this desert should be so confusing and tough to navigate through. It should feel like a tough trial the player has to go through to earn the right to enter the legendary's resting place at the Uluru-inspired location. Many of the past Pokemon games have had small challenges and mazes the player had to do before getting to a Legendary, and I think making this desert double as a trial for the player would be a great way to utilize it. When leaving the Uluru-inspired location, you would then journey to a city based on Alice Springs. Not really a lot to say about this town, other than the fact that it's located right on the edge of all the dry desert terrain of Australia. I imagine it would be quite a sight for sore eyes after journeying through the vast desert to arrive in a city that is located right along a river with a lot of greenery to it. I could also see a lot of hiking trails and perhaps its botanical gardens showing up in this Pokemon town as well. If you go south from the Alice Springs town, you would travel along a route loosely inspired by the Fink River. Australia's Fink River is important because it's been dated to be one of the oldest rivers in the world and has existed in some form for over 350 million years. 
I don't know about you guys, but this seems like a fitting place to find a lot of fossil Pokemon. If in region this river existed for that amount of time, there's a good chance you'd be able to find many Pokemon fossils in the ground and terrain besides the river. Alright, let's jump back over to the west coast of the region and take a different pathway through it. So as I mentioned earlier, if you go east from the Perth-inspired town, you would end up at a location based on the Super Pit Gold Mine, which is one of Australia's biggest mines. Mines and Pokemon aren't really a new thing for this series, but with how important ore and minerals are to Australia's economy, being that they're one of the country's prominent resources, I thought this region could give Game Freak a great opportunity to put another giant mine into a region. Once you've traveled through the mine, you'd come to the small city of Eucla. In modern day, this small locality is a really popular spot for fishing and also houses a hotel, golf club, and meteorological station. No doubt this would be a great place to have a cast form show up. After leaving the Eucla based town, you would arrive in one of the biggest landmarks of Australia, Katithanda Lake Eyre. This is a lake that sits in the lowest natural point of Australia and is something called an endorheic lake, which basically means that it has no drainage points. When water comes into the lake, usually caused by a tri-yearly flood or just the country's rainy season, it has no way to flow out and instead has to wait until it evaporates away. I'm sorry to bore everyone with the science lesson, but I think they could actually incorporate this idea into the region. Much like how the Gen 5 Pokemon games featured environments that changed with the seasons, I'd love to see this lake in region have different forms based on if it's raining or not. Lake Eyre is usually fairly empty and arid without rain, so how cool would it be to explore a dried up lake bed in game that could have all sorts of treasure and items you usually couldn't get? And then when it rains, maybe it could fill up and let you gain access to perhaps some islands or exclusive Pokemon. It could be an interesting take on a lake that we haven't seen in Pokemon yet. Continuing eastward, there would be a small village based on the city of Kobar. In real life, Kobar is a small mining town and, I mean really, that's kind of it. I'm not trying to knock the town at all, but in the past it gained popularity for the mass amount of copper that was found there and really its mine is its biggest attraction. I know we already talked about the Super Pit Gold Mine, but this city would be more like Sinnoh's Orberg City and that it has a small mine attached to it rather than being a huge mine itself. Within the depths of the mine, I imagine you'd be able to find some rare Pokemon such as Carbink or Sableye. When you've had your fun mining various stones, you can go south along the coast to a town based on Adelaide. This Australian city is well known for its art scene and has numerous festivals and buildings dedicated to traditional art, film, music, and much more. I could see the city in region having many homages to that stuff, and maybe including points of interest based off of the South Australia Art Gallery, the South Australian Museum, and Victoria Square, which is a large green space within the city. When departing, the player would go southeast to a town based on Melbourne, which is one of Australia's more populated cities. The problem I always have with these big places and turning them into Pokemon towns is that there's so much that could be included. Melbourne alone has a cathedral, one of the oldest and largest libraries in Australia, a very entertainment based side to it, an old cargo ship, and the list goes on. If I personally had to choose a couple things to include in this town, I would definitely go with Luna Park, which is one of Australia's most well-known amusement parks, the State Library of Victoria, the Queen Victoria Market, and a big resort area based on the Crown Melbourne Entertainment Complex. Moving on from the Melbourne town would put us into an area based on the city of Canberra, which is Australia's capital. In region, and hopefully this doesn't make any Canberra residents angry, I think Canberra will be better suited as the Pokemon League and Elite Four location rather than a huge city. The reason why is because Melbourne, Canberra, and Sydney, which we'll talk about next, are all big cities that are very close to each other. I wanted to include all three of these in the region, but I think that having three giant towns right next to each other might be a little bit overwhelming, which is why I think Canberra would be better suited as the spot for the Pokemon League as well as maybe a Victory Road type challenge. Moving on to the next town, we come to the largest city in the region, which is based on the largest city in Australia, Sydney. In terms of what it might include, as well as what you could do in it, I imagine the Sydney Harbour Bridge would welcome you into the city, and once you're roaming its streets, you come across many interesting locations, such as a gym based on the Sydney Opera House, the Sydney Tower, an observatory, a building inspired by the Queen Victoria Building, and an area based on the Darling Harbour, which could be like a big shopping district and have plenty of stores and stands to visit. Alright, when leaving Sydney, the player would go through a cave based on the Janolan Caves, which is a large network of limestone caves near Sydney, and end up in a town based on Brisbane. Brisbane has a large river that runs through it, and that could be one of the town's big features. Just add in some small side attractions based on the Wheel of Brisbane, the Old Windmill, and Coochie Mudlow Island, and you've got yourself a pretty nice Pokemon town. 
After leaving Brisbane, you would travel along a coastal route that would take you by one of the standout landmarks this region could have, which would be the Pokemon World's equivalent of the Great Barrier Reef. In real life, the Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef and sits just off the coast of Northeast Australia. Obviously, if something is the largest in the world, you have to include it in a Pokemon region, and the way I think they could implement the Barrier Reef into this region would be as a side activity the player could explore. Okay, so bear with me now, but what if the player could take a special Pokemon diving tour to explore this gigantic reef? You would be able to rent a Pokemon to use as an exploration buddy and dive through the reef adventuring with it. Kind of where the game element of this comes in is, I was thinking there could be different Pokemon you could rent as guides, which would have different abilities to help you access various areas within the reef. In my opinion, diving hasn't always been the coolest thing to do within Pokemon, so I'd love for this region to make it more of an exploration and discovery thing, using the massive and beautiful Great Barrier Reef as a backdrop for it. Alright, moving on, the next big locations you would come to would be a town based on Cairns, as well as a large area based on the Barren Gorge National Park. So talking Cairns, this is a coastal city that sits in a very interesting place, where it's right on the edge of Australia's rainforest territory, but is also along the coast. This gives it a very tropical feel that makes it a popular tourist destination. In region, they could play around with the idea a little bit and maybe have a couple of big hotels here, and also include a lot of small tourist type attractions like a visitor center. Now, regarding the Barren Gorge National Park, this is a large rainforest area which has numerous trails, flora, and waterfalls all throughout it. I love the idea of having the player explore a really dense jungle in this region, and it could have all sorts of bug and poison type Pokemon, secret items, and hidden areas within it. Before we get into the story section, there's just two other locations of the region that I want to jump to and talk about quickly. The first is the Evil Team's hideout, which would be located roughly here. At the risk of sounding crazy, I think their hideout could be based on some of the castles that Australia has around the country. While Australia's castles aren't really as old nor have the history of European castles, seeing as how most of them were built fairly recently within the last 200 years, I still thought it was cool that structures like this even existed in Australia. While most of them are either privately owned or tourist attractions, I really like the idea of a unique medieval building like this being in the region, and once we get into the story section, I promise this castle-themed hideout will make a lot more sense. For right now though, just know that Australia has a small number of relatively modern built castles, and this location is more or less just a general representation of them, rather than being based on a specific one. The last significant location I want to talk about is a big island that will be located just off the southern coast of the region. This is the island of Tasmania, and if I'm being upfront, I still haven't decided how it could be used in the region. My two ideas for Tasmania were that it could either be a location that you can go to and explore once you've made it to the Adelaide town by taking a boat over there, or it could potentially be a post-game area much like Sinnoh's Battle Zone. I couldn't quite decide which idea I liked better, but regardless, there would be plenty of cool stuff in this Tasmania-based island. Not only do I think a legendary Pokemon could inhabit the island, but I'd also love to see a town based on the city of Hobart, a mountainous route inspired by the mountain of Kunani slash Mount Wellington, possibly a safari zone area based on the Zoodoo Wildlife Park, and a small location based on the Bridestow Lavender Estate, which could perhaps translate into a berry farm within the region. And I think that about wraps up the location section. There were a few places I just didn't have time to go over, but hopefully you guys get a feel for what this region could be like. I tried hard to make this region's location assortment as varied as possible, while also staying true to real life Australia, so hopefully it all came together well. Okay, let's get a little more personal with this hypothetical region and talk about the characters and potential story that could be present throughout it. Now I've just gotta say up front that this region's story might feel a little bit more like fan fiction than in my other regional videos. For better or worse, I tried to create a really in-depth narrative for this region which led me to making a lot of individual characters with unique personalities and motivations. I'm not sure how much of that will shine through in this section or if it's even something you guys wanted to hear about in the first place, but regardless, I really put my all into making this region's story feel different and unique from past regions. One of the things that helps set it apart is that I made a lot of this region's narrative revolve around a bigger theme that hasn't really been explored within the Pokemon franchise. This theme will be the driving force behind a lot of the characters' motivations as well as the main conflict in the region. What is this big theme you might be wondering? Well, let's take a look. So the main idea I'd like to see shape this region's narrative and overall feeling is the general topic of safety within the Pokemon world. I know that topic is somewhat vague and pretty broad, so I focused in on a couple of the safety problems that I always see people talking about in regards to the Pokemon universe, which is how safe the Pokemon world is, and how safe Pokemon are to be around, capture, and battle. 
Now, I don't know how many people out there realize this, but Pokemon are freaking scary. Whether it's a giant ball of toxins spreading pollution everywhere, a teddy bear that can break your spine, a turtle monster that causes explosions, pretty much every single ghost type wanting to kill or possess you, we've seen that Pokemon can be, and mostly are, hazardous creatures that bring the very safety of humanity into question. Also, when you start to think about how incredibly strong legendaries are within the Poke world, you really start to wonder if humans are the dominant species in Pokemon when you have something like an Arceus that could cough and destroy an entire continent. This idea of are Pokemon safe to be around is the basis I have for the general story of this region. Because Australia is well known for having some of the most dangerous animals in the world, and as we've talked about, this Pokemon region based on it would have some of the more canonically dangerous Pokemon in it, I think as a whole this region lends itself incredibly well to having a story where the focal point is on the issue of how threatening some Pokemon can be. Now one of the reasons I like focusing on this topic for the region plot-wise is because there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. Obviously you can see it from the point of view that Pokemon are destructive monsters that need to be kept in check, but at the same time you can also see them in the opposite light, where they're just animals that don't really need to be controlled or supervised because what they're like is just their nature. This is a subject matter where no one side is completely in the right, and that's actually where a lot of the conflict and characters of the region come into play. Because there's two very strong sides to this argument, I thought of two different groups that would represent these viewpoints in the game. The evil team of this region would represent the perspective of seeing some Pokemon as too dangerous to be left unchecked and wanting many of them to be contained. While the professor of this region as well as some of the gym leaders would represent the side that thinks there's redeeming and beautiful things within all Pokemon, dangerous or not. Now it's worth mentioning that if this general synopsis sounds somewhat familiar to you, it's because I was heavily inspired by Generation 5's story when thinking of this region's. The idea of two opposing points of view clashing against each other was pretty much the main focus in the original Black and White, and I felt like this region's storyline could benefit a lot by having a setup similar to that. Don't worry though, because I didn't try to replicate Gen 5's story beat for beat, I just used it as some loose inspiration. Okay, let's get into the specific characters now and start off by talking about this region's professor. So with this professor, which I've named Professor Acacia, I really wanted him to feel different from other professors we've had in the past. Not just because he would play a bigger part in the story, but because this region and its Pokemon would be a little tougher to travel through and study, which would require a somewhat more adventurous professor. What I came up with was to have him loosely based off of one of my favorite nature experts who also happened to be Australian, Steve Irwin, aka the Crocodile Hunter. Steve Irwin was somebody who was always upbeat and adventurous while showing people how interesting animals in real life could be. Sometimes he could maybe be a little bit over the top, but you could always tell his excitement and enthusiasm was coming from a very genuine place, which is why he was one of my favorite nature specialists. With this region's professor, I'd love for him to have some of those great traits to him. He would be adventurous enough to travel through the region and examine Pokemon while also showing off his love and excitement for studying them. In the end, he would represent and show that while Pokemon can be scary and dangerous, they all have an important place in the environment and world that we need to respect and try to understand. On the flip side of that, we have this region's evil team, who pretty much embodies the polar opposite of the Professor. This evil team, which I've named Team Noble, believes that some Pokemon are too powerful and dangerous to be left to roam the wild, and need to be contained or dealt with in other ways. The main area they're targeting is the Outback Desert area, which they've deemed to have the most lethal Pokemon, although you'd see them trying to control and detain strong Pokemon all around the region. I've just gotta say that while I've been calling them an evil team, and their description probably sounds pretty sinister, I wouldn't necessarily describe their goals as flat out evil. Much like the original Team Plasma's goal of trying to separate people and Pokemon because they believed people were forcing Pokemon to fight, I tried to make this team's ambitions seem understandable and not necessarily flat out bad. Team Noble's members, as well as their leaders, have seen how much chaos, damage, and sometimes even death that powerful Pokemon have caused around the world, and believe that some Pokemon need to be restrained for the betterment of humanity. They don't have any ulterior motives or hidden plans, they're not trying to take over the region or destroy the universe, they just simply want to make this region a safer place for people. Although the means they go to to accomplish their goal might be seen as a little bit excessive and hypocritical in a way, which is what causes them to clash with the region's professor. I'll go more in depth on some of their actions as well as specific team members and their Pokemon in just a second, but I feel like I should address their designs and general theme first and why they have a medieval knight look in an Australia based region. It's a somewhat interesting story about all of this. Right from the start, I knew that I wanted the evil team of the region to have a design that really contrasted with the region and its Pokemon. I loved what Pokemon Sun and Moon did with Alola being bright, vibrant, and friendly and having Team Skull Street Gang feeling counteract that. And so I was thinking that because the Australia-based region would be harsh and rough to travel through, I wanted a more refined and poised evil team to be present throughout it. 
They'd still have a goal of being against powerful Pokemon, but their designs would bring a nice bit of juxtaposition compared to the tough region. My initial thoughts were that the evil team could have a posh or business element to it and be kind of like a team full of rich kid and lady trainer classes. I soon realized, however, that the Ether Foundation as well as kind of Team Flair had those types of designs on lockdown. So I quickly scrapped the idea and went back to brainstorming more team ideas whose motif could provide a great contrast to the harshness of the region. Eventually, after doing hours of thinking, banging my head against a wall and researching, I came up with a possible team idea that hit all the check marks and was also inspired by Australia's history. The first thing I learned about Australia that helped with this idea was that most of the early settlers who sailed to Australia in the early 1700s were from Britain and under the rule of the British monarchy. This gave me a very loose idea that the antagonist team of the region could be inspired by those historical roots and possibly have a refined royal vibe to them in reference to the British royal family. Adding on to that idea, I then found out that Australia actually has a few modern castles around the country which would perfectly fit in with this team concept. I know this might all sound a little contrived for an Australian region, but with those two ideas as my big influences, I came up with an evil team that consisted of princes and princesses in a castle hideout which eventually, with the help of bonus level, grew into the royal court evil team you're seeing in this video. Yeah, the original Team Plasma already did the whole knight thing, but I feel like Team Noble's aesthetic is still distinct in its own way. While the general idea is somewhat similar to Plasma's, the specific designs, structure of the organization, and Pokemon they use couldn't be more different. Speaking of which, let's actually go over some of the team members now. So at the very bottom of the totem pole you have the Grunts, who have a very classic armored knight design to them. Many of the Grunts were either hurt or know somebody who was harmed by a Pokemon, and they feel that Team Noble is fighting a, well, noble fight, and decided to join their ranks. Their teams would consist of Pokemon ranging from Hone Edge, Shelmet, Excelgor, Kyroblast, Escavalier, Ponyard, and Horsey, and you'd encounter them in large numbers either running rallies in cities, trying to take strong Pokemon away from trainers by force, or even just clearing out areas they believe could be dangerous to people. Next up, we come to the admins of Team Noble, which would be based on a prince and princess. Because these two designs and trainers have such a connection to each other, I think it would be cool if you battled them together mostly in double battles. As far as their teams are concerned, the prince would have a Nidoran male, Nidorino, Bisharp, Cedra, and Dewblade, while the princess would have a Nidoran female, Nidorina, Alolan Meowth, Seeking, and Steeny. At the top of Team Noble's hierarchy, we finally come to the main leaders, who would be based on a king and queen. I mean, really, this motif is a perfect way to have two team leaders, which in turn could lead to some intense double battles during your showdowns with them. Speaking of battles, I thought up full teams for each of them. Even though you would have at least one double battle against both of them, it wouldn't be a Pokemon game story if you didn't also get to fight them individually at some point, too. For the King, I think an Aegislash, Gallade, Nidoking, Zebstrika, Kingdra, and Rapidash would fit him well, while the Queen would have a Florgus, Gardevoir, Nidoqueen, Vespaquen, Serena, and Pyroar. Okay, now that we have a general idea of the themes and characters of the region, let's briefly go over how the actual story itself could play out with all of the stuff we just talked about coming together. I do have to warn you guys though, because if you thought the story was fanfiction before, then you ain't seen nothing yet. So when the player starts their journey, Team Noble will already have a pretty big influence on the region. Many people and trainers are starting to fear the potential damage that Pokemon can cause, and some are even starting to shun strong Pokemon as well as trainers who train them. It seems the only person who has stayed somewhat reasonable during this time is Professor Acacia, who takes issue with a lot of the things Team Noble is saying. You see, the Professor routinely goes around the region doing various research, and has seen the somewhat aggressive methods Team Noble uses to confine and capture Pokemon, which he strongly disagrees with. Even though the region is going through some rocky times at the moment, with more and more people becoming scared and distrustful of Pokemon, the Professor still sees a genuine love of Pokemon within you and decides to give you a starter. He encourages you to go out on a journey for the region's Pokemon League and also asks that while you're out exploring, you try to help out any Pokemon in danger from Team Noble. He's noticed that Team Noble's actions have been getting more and more dangerous as of late, and he's worried that they might try to do something drastic very soon. At this point, the player is free to explore the Australian region, and among their many journeys, they earn gym badges, make friends with some of the leaders, explore some cool landmarks, and even help Professor Acacia in various places with his research. You also see exactly what the professor was talking about, as numerous times on your journey, you would bump into Team Nobles, Grunts, and Admins trying to quote-unquote save people from dangerous Pokémon. This usually involves them either removing Pokemon from their natural habitats by force, or sometimes they do things even more reckless than that, like when they try to close off the Super Pit Gold Mine with explosives because of the Golem living inside. 
Fortunately, the player is usually on the scene to foil all their plans, but there is a moment towards the middle of the game when Team Noble captures one of the regional legendaries and the player isn't able to stop them. Although we don't quite know what they want with the legendary at this point in time, we can only assume that whatever reason they captured it for is probably not going to be good. After the legendary is taken by Team Noble, the player is then tasked with going to save it. I'm skimming over a lot of the smaller plot details I wrote down here, but the climax of the story results in the player infiltrating Team Noble's castle, battling their way through the grunts and admins, and ultimately confronting the king and queen for the fate of the legendary, as well as the entire region. You see, even though Team Noble doesn't want to take over or destroy the region like so many other Pokemon villains, they've still found a way to use the power of the legendary Pokemon to fulfill their ultimate plans in making the region safer, and disposing of any Pokemon they deem as threatening or too powerful. Slight sidebar here, but I should probably talk a little bit about what the legendary represents, as well as its special power that makes it so crucial to Team Noble's plans. So this legendary represents emotion, and is part of a duo with another legendary that represents logic. I've always loved when legendaries represent two opposing themes that are connected to each other, and logic versus emotion is one of the oldest concepts in the human psyche. While I won't get too deep into all the symbolism these Pokemon have within the story, I do want to talk a little bit about a special power the emotion legendary has, and why Team Noble wants it under their control. Basically, this legendary has the ability to either boost or diminish a creature's emotions. This avian legendary can make other Pokemon feel very energetic and lively, or dull and lifeless. The latter of which would be a dream scenario for Team Noble's vision of a safer Poke world. In fact, that's actually the end game of Team Noble's plan. Now that the King and Queen have the legendary under their control, they're going to use its emotion manipulation powers to emotionally tone down any Pokemon in the region they think could be dangerous or cause anybody harm. It's a pretty crazy plan, but right before they're able to put it into action, the player shows up to stop them. Normally this would be where you have a one-on-one -on -one battle against a team's leader, but the big difference here is that the player has a climactic double battle against both leaders, with the help of Professor Acacia. That's right, he's here too, and is determined to help you stop Team Noble. You might be wondering why he's doing such a daring thing, as normally Pokemon professors never help with taking down the evil team, and it's at this moment that many of the mysteries and motivations surrounding Team Noble and the Professor are revealed, when we find out that the Professor and King are brothers. <gasps> <gasps> Shocking reveal aside, the Professor Professor and King's relationship is understandably not the greatest, as they both fall on opposing sides of the Are Pokemon Dangerous argument. It wasn't always that way though, and if we dive a little bit into their past, we can see what caused this rift between them and the origins of Team Noble. Essentially, what happened was when they were younger, both of them went through a very traumatic experience involving a rampant Pokemon killing their sister. While we don't know the exact details of what happened all those years ago, we do know that the three siblings had accidentally stumbled upon a Pokemon's nest when it suddenly attacked them, leaving their sister fatally injured. This is the moment where everything changed for the King and Professor. With their sister now gone because of a wild Pokemon, they both had strong, albeit different reactions to everything that had transpired. The King's gut reaction to all of this was blaming the Pokemon for being too powerful and uncontrollable, and he vowed that day to not let anybody else get injured by a Pokemon. No matter the cost, he would do all he could to stop a Pokemon from causing harm, even if he had to resort to harsher methods to restrain one. The Professor, on the other hand, had a somewhat contrasting view on the matter. While he agreed that Pokemon could be dangerous, he also realized that the more he thought about it, the more he could see the Pokemon's point of view in all of this. Having three strangers suddenly drop into your living room would understandably make anyone upset and scared, and the Professor started to see that this situation was all just an unfortunate accident caused by a misunderstanding and a high amount of tension between everyone. After coming to this conclusion, the Professor sought to learn more about many different Pokemon's behaviors, habitats, and biologies, in the hopes that all this research could help other people in the future. If he could understand where a Pokemon is coming from and what it's like, he could potentially stop tragic and life-threatening situations between people and Pokemon without either of the two getting hurt. As the years went by, the brothers' two differing viewpoints caused them to grow further and further apart until they ended up where they are today. One being the founder and leader of a giant organization trying to help people from vicious Pokemon, and the other a dedicated professor that loves studies and tries to understand all Pokemon. After all the tragic backstory details are revealed, you and the professor finally engage the leaders in a double battle, with the professor calling upon the aid of his best Pokemon, Crocodile. The battle would be intense, but once the king and queen are beaten, the two brothers come to an understanding with one another, and have a somewhat insightful conversation about their goals and views on things. While the king doesn't promise that he'll change his opinion on dangerous Pokemon right away, he does start to realize that he might have gone a little bit too far in trying to make the region safer. While the king and professor are talking things out after the battle, the queen still holds strong to her beliefs and won't accept defeat that easily. 
she decides to use the legendary Pokemon herself to challenge the player to one final battle. The King and Professor are too exhausted from the prior battle to do anything to stop her, so the true peak of the story comes down to a one-on-one -on -one showdown against the Queen and her fully healed team, including a legendary Pokemon. There's a lot more story details and smaller subplots I could share, but pretty much everything else I thought of, which trust me is quite a lot, is more backstory stuff that I don't think is super critical to detail in this video. I tried to hit most of the major points that could shape the region's narrative, so hopefully it gave you guys a general idea on what the evil team and story of an Australia region could be like. Alright, really quickly, before we get to the final section of this video, I wanted to go over what the possible gym leaders of this region could be, as well as their types and signature Pokémon. First up, we have a Steel-type gym leader that's into industrial art and has a layer on that helps shape steel. Second, a Ground-type leader based on an archaeologist, with their main Pokémon being a Golurk that they uncovered in one of their digs. A Rock-type leader based on a classic Australian Ranger with a Lycan Rock as their partner Pokémon. A Water-type leader that's a surfer and hangs tongue with his Meryl. A Normal-type musician gym leader that could be in the Sydney Opera House and uses a Loudred. A Bug-type gym leader that studies the region's many Bug-type Pokémon and oftentimes does research on their Venonat. A Fighting-type gym leader that is a Boxer with a Primeape. And last but not least, a Ghost-type gym leader that runs an old timey bed and breakfast with a lampant. Alright, we've almost talked about everything regarding this region, but there's just one last thing I haven't gone over yet, which is all the new Pokémon this Australia-based region could have. I've mentioned it a few times already, but Australia has so much diversity when it comes to animals, which in turn means that this region could have some great new Pokémon. Whether it's some of Australia's more well-known animals, some of the scarier ones, or even endemic ones that aren't found anywhere else, the country has tons of creatures that are fantastic inspiration for brand new Pokémon. While I didn't have enough time to create Pokemon based off of every cool animal within Australia, I was able to think of 15 new Pokemon ideas which all stem from the country's unique wildlife. Six regional forms, one fossil Pokemon, six common Pokemon, and two legendaries. As per usual, I'll make sure to discuss what the Pokemon is based on, its typing, and potential abilities it could have. Let's start with the regional forms. As always, I need to clarify that at this point in time, we don't know if regional Pokémon forms, such as Alolan forms, are going to continue on with the franchise moving forward. For the sake of this video, I'm assuming that we'll continue to see regional variants in future Pokémon games, but even if we don't, here's a few ideas I have for Australia regional forms. The first idea is a Dark-type variant of Komala inspired by something called a Drop Bear. In Australian folklore, a drop bear is essentially a carnivorous rabbit version of a koala. It's said to have fangs, be extremely aggressive, and drops down from trees onto unsuspecting people. Since the standard Kamala would definitely be a staple of this region, I thought it'd be kind of fun to have a more aggressive Dark-type variant of that that could jump out of trees on you while you're just exploring. It could also have a higher attack stat and an ability like Intimidate or Arena Trap to make you even more paranoid when you're adventuring through forests. The next two regional forms I thought of were variants of Joltik and Galvantula inspired by some of Australia's famous spiders, mainly the Australian Redback and Black Widow. Both of these Pokémon would be Bug Dark-type and would represent some of the more terrifying bugs and arachnids that live in Australia. We've already talked about how this region's story would ride on having scarier and more intense Pokémon living in the region, and these variants would fit nicely into that category. As far as abilities go, I was thinking they could have their own version of Alolan Diglett's Tangling Hair ability, which would make it so that every time an enemy Pokémon hits it with a contact move, the Pokémon that attacked would have its speed lowered. I was also thinking they could have a unique ability that made it so if they poisoned a Pokémon, the affected Pokémon would have a 20% chance of becoming confused as well, in reference to how the Black Widow's poison can have many negative effects on creatures it bites. The last regional forms I thought of come to us from the Geodude line, where I think they could be rock psychic and have lots of energy-filled crystals breaking out of them. The inspiration for these regional forms comes from the fact that Australia's soil is very rich with minerals and ore, and this would be a reference to that by showing what Geodude, Graveler, and Golem who form this region's ground are like. Not only does forming in this region's ground make them look pretty cool, but the crystals that form within their bodies are also the source of their psychic powers. Moving on to the next category of new monsters, we come to the fossil Pokémon. I only thought of one, but dare I say, I think it's one of the better ideas I've had. So basically, what the fossil of this region could be is a Pokémon based on an extinct animal called the Abduridong, which is basically a giant prehistoric platypus. Australia is well known for its platypus assortment, and I think it would be great to have the fossil Pokémon be a water rock type inspired by the modern platypus and extinct Abduridong. For abilities, I was thinking this Pokémon could utilize its rocky tail and have its own version of the Sticky Hold ability, which would make it so that nothing could happen to an item it's holding. Alright, let's move on to the next category of potential new Pokémon, which is just all the common Pokémon you'd find around the region. 
I did look mainly at some of the more well-known animals in Australia for inspiration with these ones, but I think you'll also see some more distinctive ones in here too. First up, we have a Pokemon based on a Wombat. The Wombat is a type of animal that is native to Australia and is somewhat common throughout the country. It has powerful teeth, but also has traits of moles as well, mainly with its claws and how it likes to dig underground. For this Pokemon, I envision it as being the early game rodent you would encounter, much like Rattata, Young Goose, Bidoof, etc. Typing-wise, I see it as either pure normal or potentially even a normal ground type. For abilities, I'd like to see this guy have tough claws, which powers up moves that make direct contact. Surely with a somewhat decent ability like this, you won't abandon him after Route 1, right? Right? Next up is a Pokemon and its evolution based on a Kangaroo, more specifically, the Red Kangaroo. Now before anybody says it, yeah, Kangaskhan is technically based on a Kangaroo too, but I mean, come on. I think it's safe to say that most of us want a Kangaroo Pokemon that looks more in line with a normal Kangaroo and not some kind of bulky, monstrous version of one. I'm sorry for the harsh words, Kangaskhan, you're still awesome, but I think an Australian region would be the perfect place to introduce a couple new Kangaroo Pokemon. These two Pokemon would be fighting type, as kangaroos are notorious for being aggressive and fighting each other or people, and they'd have a bunch of kicking related moves. For their abilities, Moxie, which boosts a Pokemon's attack stat when it knocks out a Pokemon, would be a fantastic ability for these Pokemon. Also, with these Pokemon having such an emphasis on kick related attacks, a new ability that increases the accuracy of kicking moves would be a good idea too, I feel. Next, we have a Poison Fairy type Pokemon based on a Pygo Potidae. It took me about 12 takes to say that name right, and even then I'm just crossing my fingers that I pronounced it correctly, but what this animal is essentially, is a legless lizard. Really, I just thought this was an interesting animal that could be included. The few snake-like Pokemon we have are either Poison or Dark type, and I'd love to see a Pokemon like this that is similar to those, but at the same time very different. For its abilities, I'm thinking either Fairy Aura, which powers up fairy type moves, or Shed Skin, which has a chance to remove a status condition from the Pokemon each turn. Moving to the next common Pokemon, we find ourselves face to face with a Ground Steel type Pokemon based on a Dingo. Dingoes are wild dogs that roam around the Australian Outback, and it only makes sense that this region would have a few of these running around it. With its abilities, I really tried to play around with the whole part Steel type angle to it, and I was thinking Magnet Pole, which prevents Steel type Pokemon from escaping, or Steel Worker, which powers up Steel type moves, would be neat to see. The final common Pokemon we'll be talking about today is one inspired by an emu. You guys know the emu, right? It's the second largest bird in the world, doesn't have the ability to fly, and is only found in Australia. It's a pretty unique bird to say the least, which is why it could make such a great Pokemon. Because the emu can't fly in real life, I couldn't in good conscience make a Pokemon based on it a flying type, and that's why I imagine it as a mono grass type. For abilities, because this Pokemon is mostly a bush with flowers, Chlorophyll, which would raise a Pokemon's speed in sunshine, or Flower Veil, which prevents the lowering of an ally grass type Pokemon's stats, would be fitting for it. Last but not least, let's close out the video by going over the possible legendaries of the region. I've already mentioned them a few times in the other sections, but these two Pokemon would represent the idea of logic versus emotion, and both would be seen as powerful, dignified protectors of this Australian region. Let's first talk about the Emotion Legendary, which would be a fairy flying type Pokemon based on the Lyrebird. Lyrebirds are a species of bird that inhabit Australia and have two defining features. The first is that their tails look extremely similar to a lyre, and the second is that they're able to mimic a wide variety of sounds, including human speech. Ideally, I'd like both of those traits to transfer into this legendary and even inspire its signature ability. In Generation 7, we were introduced to the ability Dancer, which lets a Pokemon copy any dance-related move an enemy Pokemon does and use it against them. With this legendary, I'd like to see it have a similar ability, but with singing and voice related moves. If an enemy Pokemon uses something like Sing, Hyper Voice, Disarming Voice, or any other song slash voice related moves against it, it will be able to use its singer ability and fling those noises right back at the opposing Pokemon. The second legendary, which would represent logic, would be based on an aboriginal Australian deity known as the Rainbow Serpent, and be a water dragon type. In Australia's mythology, the Rainbow Serpent is heavily associated with water and is seen as a giver of life. It's said that if a waterhole doesn't dry up during a drought, then the Rainbow Serpent is usually the cause of such prosperity. Really not a whole lot else I can say about it, to be honest. I think the Rainbow Serpent sounds awesome, and a legendary Pokemon based on it could be really interesting. For its ability, I thought it could have a unique one where once its health got below 25% full, it would automatically summon an Aqua Ring for itself. I have no idea if this would be overpowered or not, but I thought it would be a neat reference to its water and life-giving associations. 
And with that, this what if Pokemon region video has come to a close. Australia really is an awesome country with so much that could be adapted into the Pokemon world. From unique locations and environments, a potential story revolving around the dangers of Pokemon, and all the brand new Pokemon that could be introduced with it, I really hope I was able to represent Australia accurately and make an awesome region out of it. Anyways, what do you guys think? Would you want to explore a region like this? Do you agree or disagree with Team Noble? Maybe I missed a cool area, potential plot point, or Pokemon idea for the region. Feel free to leave all your thoughts and opinions on this Australia region in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you later.